There we are. Um, I, I just want to give a, a little bit of motivation uh, for, for why we do some of these uh, synthetic uh, constructions inside pot, and then I'll go back to the, um, the hot library again. Uh, so we've already seen that um, types are actually group words or uh, not. I mean, the, the first first modeling is types as sets, and then types as group words. Types as two group words, so we have co coherence conditions for associativity. And then we actually go into infinity group words, and we'll hear more about this later. I think in uh, Christian's lecture. Um, then there's the motivation from uh, topos theory, and I'm I'm not going to explain what a topos is. This is going to be very hand wavy. But one explanation of a topos is, uh, so, so there are many ways of describing it. And there's this picture of the, uh, the wise men and they're all fighting about what, what a um, uh, wise blind man. So they're all trying to explain what a topos is. And one is saying, well, it's, it's like a broom and another one saying, well, it's like a tree. And the other one saying, it's like a, um, uh, a fan because he's looking at ears. Um, so they're all uh, having a different explanation of what um, what a topos is. Sorry, what an elephant is. And Peter Johnson, in his uh, his tome on topos theory, he says, "Well, toposes are, are the same. There are many ways of describing what they are, and and this is where part of the interest actually comes from." Um, so a topos is like a semantics, and and this is important for us. It's a semantics for intuitionistic formal systems, and especially intuitionistic high order logic or a type theory. Uh, depending on, on how you choose to represent it. Um, there are also categorical descriptions that are less important for us now. You can also see it as a generalized space. Uh, Toposes have actually uh, become more and more important. For example, in the uh, normalization of cubical type theory, uh, Topos theory plays a, a fairly big role. Uh, there was a question that came up on Discord before on uh, philosophical um uh philosophical aspects uh one way of seeing is you can uh look at the free topos and there's a, a nice paper by lombeck and scott about this and you can see this as a foundation for mathematics uh so this in some ways the, the syntax of topos theory and this is a proposal to reconcile uh formalism platonism intuitionism and in some way this is actually not too far away from uh um, what's happening in type theory. Now there's a notion of a higher topos. So a topos is a, a generalization of sets because it's a model of intuitionistic high order logic. Um, but we also have these, uh, sorry, the group points generalization of sets. So we're, we're having a, a generalization of sets in two ways. And what the, um, Higher top of such it actually uh, combines those uh, those two directions of generalizing sets. Uh, so this is a big uh, uh, a big big theory about uh, higher toposes. There's a big book by uh, Jacob Ruby, for example, that describes the uh, higher toposes. Um, there's a whole mouthful that uh, I think Christian will say a little bit about the model categories. So it's a model category equivalent equivalent to a simplicial sheets on some model infinity side. If you know what these words mean, uh, you know that this is a, um, sli sli slightly off because this is not really a model of Martin of type theory because they're coherence conditions, but this can be can be made precise. Uh, but the important part, important thing is that uh, modulo some coherent conditions. Uh, these things are the higher toposes precisely correspond to um, type theory with univalence in precisely the same way as we have that correspondence for ordinary toposes with intuitionistic high order logic. Uh, type theory, of course, is a similar elephant. So it's a foundation for constructive mathematics. It's a calculus for proofs. It's an abstract programming language, and it's a system for developing computer proofs. We all know this. And then we have homotopy type theory. I don't know whether uh, Andre actually explained this pun already. 
So homotopy type theory is the theory of homotopy types, but it's also a homotopical version of type theory. Uh, so here's the definition of truncation that we've seen before. Uh, I could not show this uh, in this way because it's a, um, there's a very nice presentation in the library which depends on um, the use of modalities. Um, which is a very rich theory that we worked on with um, Mike Schulman and, and with Egbert Reich. Um, so this, these things can be done in a very high level of generality, but then they're not the most uh, real. So I didn't want to show this part of the, uh, the library. Um, but what is important from this higher inductive definition is that this precisely gives the reflection into the near proposition. That's something that, we, uh, that I hinted at. And actually, there's a language for what are called regular categories. So those are categories where you have an image factorization. Um, so in sets, every map from A to B vectors via the image of the function uh, with an, an epi and then a mono from of this image into the, uh, the codomain. And the observation here is that uh, having such a su such a truncation is precise enough to define this uh, this image. Uh, so what we now see is that, and, and this was studied first by uh, Steve Audi and Andre Bauer, um, to understand these regular categories. But now we can actually go back and see that once we have such a um, truncation. Um, we can also show that we actually have uh, have a good good category of sets in this case. Enable the chat. So what we can now uh, easily show, and I'll uh, uh, yeah again, this is done in a, a very high level of abstraction in the uh, on the in the hot library because again it it works for all modalities. So each map in eight sets, but actually this holds for every truncation level and, and in fact for every modality can be split in such a, uh, first a surjection and then an injection, first an epi and then a mono. And this means that eight sets, they actually form a regular category and this generalizes. So I showed, this is a well-known um, well fact from uh, abstract homotopy theory, and this can be proved very nicely in, uh, in a hot um, what one then does is, so at this level, one says that the uh, factorization is unique. Um, but what one says at the homotopical level is that the space of factorizations is actually contractible. And again, this can be very nicely presented in, uh, in a hot. Uh, now, unique choice can be uh, presented quite nicely, but I'll, I'll do this in a file in a minute. Um, so this follows directly from the elimination principle of truncations, that we actually have such a yota operation. Um, so the yota operation is similar to Hilbert's epsilon operation, um, which gives you classical logic or some form of classical logic. But the yota operation is, uh, is more harmless. So it says that if you actually have a... Um, uh, yeah, it allows you, if, if there's only one object, then you can actually take it out. Uh, now, this seems very nice, and this fits very nicely with, uh, with topos theory. Um, one problem is that in Koch, we cannot ex escape the propositions. And so you can see this as a, uh, as a problem in, uh, in Koch, but there's actually a good, good reason for this. Uh, because we want to do, want to extract programs. So we can write um, programs together with their pre and post conditions using sigma types for both the domain and the codomain. And then uh, we can go from cock to a camel and just um, remove the pre and post conditions. And this is because we know that we can completely, uh, we can never actually use those preconditions. But if we have such a uh, such unique choice, uh, then then we need to carry out all this information around. There's a question. 
uh yeah so so uh that should be uh shouldn't be too hard to find the uh um the paper the paper is called propositions as bracket types it should be on andre's uh, website uh so the uh well, what i mentioned before is we have this set order construction and of course this quite this is quite a bit of machinery that we have in, in Coq. Um, and this is because we don't have quotients in Coq. We don't have quotient types. Uh, so we, we build, and this is something that can be done for every, uh, for, for good categories, for example, for regular categories, we can take the exact completion. So we freely add quotients to a category. And what uh, Arno Spivak showed was that set works in Cox actually gives you a greater tuples. So it, it looks very much like a tuples, um, but you don't have this unique choice principle. So now we want to see what properties the uh, sets actually have in homotopy theory. Much of what I'm saying here is, is in uh, chapter 10 of the book, and it's also in the paper with, uh, with, Egbert, uh, with, with Egbert. <coughs> So what, what Vladimir Vovotsky did was he used univalence to provide impredictive quotients. So what you do is you take the, uh, the usual construction in uh, set theory where you make the quotients by the, uh, taking the, uh, the type of all equivalence classes. But this requires a power type um, and you want the power type to be small, uh, but this, uh, this cannot be done. So here you uh, need this uh, proposition, this uh, resizing action. I'll get to in a minute. Um, this also depends on propositional univalence. Uh, so this propositional univalence is, uh, uh, says that um, equivalent propositions are actually equal. But we can also, and I'll do this in, uh, in, in Emacs in a minute, uh, we can also define the quotient as a higher inductive type. And this is precisely as you would like. So you would have, have a map from the type from a type A to the quotient. You add a path. Like so, if the if X and Y are related, then under this map in the quotient, they're actually equal. Uh, and then you would think that you would be done if you're a bit sloppy, but you actually need to make sure that. This is a set again, because we want to make the set quotient. So this is um, something that, uh, a pattern that comes up quite uh, quite often. So this is a truncated co-limit. So we could also write this one here. We add some syntactic sugar. And then in the, in the file I'll show you in a minute, we actually verify the universal properties of these quotients. Uh, one important property of these uh, universal properties is what is called exactness. Uh, now we check that set, that the eight sets actually form what is called a pre -topos. So it's an extensive exact category. So it has good co-products. That's easy to check in, uh, uh, in type theory. And it has good quotients. We already observed in the beginning, and that's uh, to some extent what uh, and we already saw yesterday. So the eight sets, they're closed on their pi types and they're also closed on the inductive types. So the eight sets actually form a model of what is, well, they form a pi w pre top also. It's a model of constructive set theory. If we add the action of choice to type theory, which of course is an action, so, so that's uh, a bit dangerous, but then we actually have, um, so from, the axiom of choice, we get classical logic and impredictivity. Um, so we get a well-pointed Boolean elementary topos. So this is Lovier's structural set theory. So then we can do basically all of uh, classical logic, uh, classical set theory. So now uh, I want to say a, a little bit about predictivity. Uh, so mo most People in Coq or in type theory are used to this, but I, uh, um, not, I mean, the, the level of, of background in type theory varies. So I want to say a bit about this. Um, so, impredictivity 
so in an imperative definition, you just give a specification. You say, well, it's the minimal thing such that the following holds. Predicative definitions, we typically give a construction. Um, predicativity is also a reaction uh, to Russell's paradox. So, um, and, and this is close to Rioja's paradox in type theory. So we cannot have a set of all sets. So we want to carefully distinguish between small and large object, uh, objects. And so we want to be careful. Uh, we quantify over propositions that we don't end up in the propositions again. So prop will not be small. And uh, Martin left half here is actually predictive. Um, another way of seeing this, if you like thinking about proof theoretic strength, um, so the distinction between uh, classical logic and constructive logic is actually not so big in terms of what one can prove with this because one can translate classical logic into constructive logic by the double negation translation. But the proof theoretic strength of the constructive set theory is much lower than the other two. So it, it's also a way of being careful uh, to, to use predicative uh, constructions. And of course, in Cockrell, used to doing this. Uh, and this is a bit of surprise. There's a very nice blog post by, by Mike Schulman where he explains that um, this predictivity actually fits very well with what is happening in high dimensional mathematics. So usually the n plus one category of all small n categories will not be small. Now, what happens if we take n is minus one, then we get the zero categories of all minus one categories. So this is the, the a zero category is the same as a post set and the minus one category are the truth values. So in this case, we would get the post set of all truth values. So this is the, um, uh, these are the propositions. So now by accident, and, and we'll get to this again in a minute, um, in classical mathematics, this thing is small, but if you go up the higher dimensions, you see there's actually, there's no reason why it should be small. Um, so Vladimir actually proposed resizing rules so that we could actually do uh, quite a few of the constructions from classical set theory that we're used to. Um, the way he formulated it first 10 years ago in his presentation in, in uh, Bergen, so that's something that uh, it's a way of adding predictivity, but uh, that version, we don't know, uh, we, we're not aware of any models of those precise rules that he gave. Um, but if you phrase it carefully, like we did in a hot book, it actually holds in many models in the, uh, the higher troubles models. And now we can see what we already saw when we begun, uh, we had this, uh, this type in type, but it wasn't really type in type. There's a, a careful uh, bookkeeping that Cog does be behind the scenes where it keeps track of which, which universes we're using. So what we can show is that we actually have a subobject classifier. So a subobject classifier is uh, the categorical way of saying that we have a type of propositions. So now if we use propositional univalence, so propositional univalence just said, um, we have a by implication and we have an equivalence. Um, then we see that the propositions actually classifies all monomorphisms into A. So if we have a one-to-one a -one correspondence between monomorphisms into A or subsets of A if you want and predicates on A like so. And if you're, if you're a tuples theorist then you write this or a category theorist, you write this nice universal diagram. Can I ask um, a question about yeah. the models that you spoke about? I know in the simplicial set model that you have propositional resizing. Do we have this in other models as well? I wasn't aware. Uh, the propositional resizing holds in all um, uh, Grotendieck uh, higher doubles. 
Does that help? I'll take your word for it. Uh, I think there's a remark along those lines in the in the book. Sure. So how do you get reminded? Oh. I think we'll stop. You can put on personal results and silence in the Google Home app. Uh, so, uh, yeah, uh, this is something I already explained. So, this, this universal property here is, a, um, uh, is the, the universal property of the, uh, the subroutine classifier, as I explained. Uh, as a sanity check, we can show that the epics epimorphisms are actually subjected. And this is again done by universe polymorphism. Uh, I think I'll show you this in the, uh, in the power in a minute. Now, so, so far this is uh, all at the set level, um, but it's actually a surprising reformulation of the univalence section by looking at this subobject classifier and making it into an object classifier. And this was sort of expected by the experts of uh, higher topos theory. They, uh, uh, the uh, univalence action wasn't a big surprise to them when they really started to think about it, but it's, uh, um, Kovatsi really came up with this uh, this idea of, of the univalence action, and that then holds very naturally in these uh, in these higher topos. The only change that we make, so I'll, I'll move back and forth, is we change the notion of a subobject here into any map like so. But now there can be if we have an element here, then the fiber over that point uh, is not no longer a proposition. But it's actually a whole, there, there can be a whole type of things over this. So we also need to change uh, the page propositions here into the type. So the map you get here is your map uh, to an, an element here, the fiber over that point. So now we can look at the, uh, and the families over A, and this is. Uh, if you, you, you're used to um, models of type theory, if, you, if you're thinking of categories of families, it's those kind of families. Um, so we know that the families over A are equivalent to maps from A to type. This is the code in the, uh, construction that you want using univalence. And then the uh, pointer types, they're just types combined with a point in it. And it's denoted like so. So this, the universe now not only classifies uh, the monomorphisms or the uh, subsets, but it classifies all the maps plus the group action of isomorphism or equivalence. And this existence of the uh, object classifier or actually of an off object classifier of an off universes is one of the, uh, one of the ways of phrasing uh, this is a, a, a crucial construction in, uh, in infinity topos. So the object classifier is, is a well-known construction in, uh, in higher topos theory, um, but it's usually not phrased in terms of invariance. Now, and again, uh, like I said, we had this nice blog post by Mike Schulman where he showed that uh, impredictivity is an action, it is an, is some sort of accident that just happens on a very low uh, dimension. Uh, the same thing actually shows up here that for the H propositions, this happens to be the unit type, which is small. But here, of course, the pointer types uh, that will be big as big as the uh, type itself. And then what we did with, uh, with Eckbert was to show that if you have univalence, then you get an object classifier. Um, we also show that uh, the descent property and, and Egbert has a lot of this in his, uh, in his thesis. Um, the, uh, the descent says that the homotopy to co-limits or the uh, high inductive types if you want, 
um, they actually behave, uh, they behave well, they behave in the way you expect. So all these three properties are actually equivalent. So you can take either of those and derive the, uh, the other two. Um, as I said, so those two are defining properties of a higher topos and then univalence so is an insight from uh, from finding the equivalence. Um, I, I had hoped that this uh, this statement had made it into Eckbert's book, but unfortunately it doesn't seem to be there. Uh, so we should really uh, make sure we uh, we get it written up. Um, but it's a, it, it should be a good uh, conversation exercise. And I'll come back to this. Find the right. Um, yeah, now I want to tell you a bit more about the uh, the unpredictivity. Um, so, what was in uh, in Vladimir's foundation uh, library? So, where he started to develop uh, uh, the univalent foundations, he defined he didn't have a higher inductive type. So, he defined the truncation in the following way. Um, so, for each proposition, so you define a um, for each type, you take the uh, CPS translation. Uh, so A to P to P, where for, for each uh, proposition here. So you just write the elimination, uh, what is it? You write the elimination principle for the truncation of A. And uh, so this, but this requires impredicativity to make this uh, into a small uh, type again. Otherwise, the, uh, uh, the type, what is it? The universe level goes up, uh, goes up here. So this is where this uh, type is type, type and type is used. This is one of the places where this type and type is used in the, uh, in the Unimath library. So instead of this uh, type and type, you can also use the propositional resizing. Uh, I think I have opened. No. So instead of saying that the um, uh, actually, I just tilt it here. That might be more useful. So instead of saying that um, each proposition is actually in the lowest universe, that something of which we don't have a have a model, we say if something is a proposition, uh, then we can find something in a lower universe um, that's not equal to it but so it said it's equivalent. So we can, we have a resizing operation that takes a type, uh, if it's a proposition and maps it to the universe J. And moreover, we have an equivalence between A and uh, the resized version of that. So the propositional resizing, as I said, holds in, uh, holds in many models. Um, it's a nice formalization challenge if you if you think that the um, the exercises are too easy. Prove that um, the imperative truncation defined here is actually equivalent to the uh, uh, to the truncation that's defined as higher inductive type. The imperative truncation can also be found in this form. Now, as I said, the uh, truncation uh, as it's defined as a uh, as a higher inductive type. So that's done at a very high level of generality. So I want to uh, focus on the set quotient, which is done in a more pedestrian way. That's a unique choice I already showed you.
Yeah, so this is the set quotient, which is, again, it's a, uh, So this time I actually checked that everything compiled. So this is the structure I showed you before. So we have, uh, we want to model the quotient for each two related elements. We actually add a path between their uh, representatives, between the represented classes, and we add a truncated. Uh, we make it into a truncated, a uh, set truncated construction. So we use the private inductive type here. We add the action. We add the action that it's a set. We define the induction principle as before. We did precisely the same thing for the interval and for the uh, the quo uh, the uh, co equalizers. So I'm hoping that you start to recognize the, uh, the pattern. Uh, then we show that it's actually, it actually computes, but only propositionally. And then we uh, close the module again so that the inconsistency doesn't escape. Then we prove a number of basic properties about the, uh, about the quotients and This is what is called exactness of quotients. So for the quotients, the equivalence classes are related. Equivalence classes of X and Y are equal, even only if X and Y are related. So this really means that we have good quotients. And if you want to have a look at this file, uh, this is really all fairly straightforward. So it's, it will be much easier to read than the uh, stuff uh, using modalities. Then we show that the uh, quotient is a subjection. And I think that was one. Yes, so here's another challenge if you like. Uh, this is actually proved in, uh, in some detail in the, in the book. Um, so we now have two constructions of the quotient. One is the impredicative one uh, that Kowalski uses. So the impredicative construction is the one that you would also find in, in Bourbaki, for example. So it's the, um, the collection of all equivalence classes of the relation. Uh, you can also formulate it using the Yoneda lemma if you want. To. Um, and now what's much missing from the library is the fact that the Impredictive quotient here is equivalent to the quotient as a higher inductive type. In part, it's missing because the construction of the impredictive quotient is not in the library. Yet. So even doing that would be a nice addition. I believe that's what I wanted to show you from this file. Yes. So this gives us the um, the set quotients. And again, this depends on univalence, but only the propositional variance. So if you want to keep track of the, uh, want to keep track of precisely which actions we're using, and we can do this in the, uh, or we do this in the library by using type classes. Uh, so we carefully track where we're using uh, the univalence section or the propositional univalence section. Uh, we can show that this is, uh, this is really what we're, you only need propositional univalence to, uh, to construct this quotient. So now using this, so we can either do, uh, use imperativity to define the quotients, or we can uh, do them as a higher, as a higher inductive type. And yeah, we've, we've shown in the book, but haven't shown in the um, in the hot library, 
uh, that those are XD equivalent. Uh, the other properties like the image factorizations, they hold too, but the formalization uh, is, is on a very general level, so I won't show that. Um, now, as I said, we have a um, the H propositions, they give a large uh, sub-object classifier, but if we add the resizing action, then this actually becomes small, we can find an object, a small object. So then we actually have a topos. Uh, we also have unique choice, and that's something that I showed you before. And this can be phrased like so, or you can write down the, uh, the Yoda operation. Now we do have unique choice. One can wonder what about the, uh, the full XMOF choice. So, uh, what are the plus and, okay, this is sort of a, an orthogonal question. Um, what about the full XMOF choice? Well, that one is not provable because it implies classical logic and we have models of type theory where we don't have classical, um, classical logic. Um, how about countable choice? Uh, again, we have uh, certain topos and higher topos models where countable choice doesn't work. So it, it's not, not provable in, uh, uh, in uh, homotopy type theory. In fact, in cubicle type theory, it probably, is, uh, probably doesn't hold. Christian may actually say more about these models. Then some, uh, some pointers, we have this directory on meta theory, which gives a, a couple of relations between the, um, um, between the axioms. So for, ex for example, the existence of the higher inductive type of the interval implies functional extensionality. I guess you will see more about this in the, uh, well, both in the um, iron proof assistant, which is based on the type theory with the interval, but certainly also in the um, uh, cubicle type theory. Uh, I won't show you this proof because it looks much nicer in, uh, in cubicle and in iron too, uh, by the way. Um, because the truncation of the booleans actually is the interval, if we have a truncation, then we also have functional exchangeality. So that's quite direct by combining it with, uh, with this one. Um, we can also construct the, uh, the object classifier. And close this one. So what I showed you on the slides here is that we want to show that families over A are equivalent to maps from A into type, uh, proof relevant relations, if you want, over proof relevant predicates over A. And this can be formalized quite directly. Uh, See, writing this down and checking the proofs is quite um, quite direct. And as you can see, this is something you can just replay. It's a bit too much to replay uh, online, but you see, it's uh, it's about two screens to actually construct the uh, the object classifier. So this is quite a uh, quite an important result in higher topos theory. And you can also do the uh, the sub object classifier. It's all fairly short. And, uh, and readable. Uh, and that's a challenge I gave you before. So if you have a object, an object classifier, not just a sub-object classifier, then the Euler variance actually holds. Um, let's see. So what I did was to uh, yeah, give you a, a very much a bird's eye view of, of some of the um, uh, some of the aspects of the the hot library um, 
focusing in, in, in part on uh, some of the things we did in chapter 10 of the, uh, the hot book. I showed you some of the, uh, the gory details. Also gave you a live demonstration how things can go wrong if you're uh, using the, young, the, the wrong open switch. Um, so yeah, I just hope that this gives you some, some idea of, of what the uh, hot library looks like. I uh, hope you have fun with the, uh, with the exercises. And if you have even more fun, then please submit a pull request if you have, have proved something that, uh, that you'd like to uh, keep. Any, uh, any questions?